We're live. Praise God. Good to be live, isn't it? Welcome to our service tonight at Grace Fellowship of Georgetown. The Spirit of God has already shown up here tonight, and uh, it's good to be in the house of God. It's good to step into that corporate anointing. You know, Karen Stewart gave a testimony Sunday morning about how, you know, she didn't realize how much anointing was on this place until she was away from it for a while. And uh, how precious it is to gather with the saints and how much love there is when we come together and, and, and uh, partake of joint services, right? And I know that God's going to speak to us tonight, as he always does. And so let's get into the word. Are you ready for this? Turn in your Bibles with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Well, we're not starting there anyway. But you can be turning there. Uh, to back up as far as some of the things that have happened lately, and I've shared all of this already before. But about three weeks ago, we were at all-night prayer, and I had a vision. And it was a very short vision. It wasn't into like a big screen thing, but I just saw a big sheet of sheet metal, about six foot square. And uh, the sheet metal had been totally rusted out. I mean, it was just totally trash metal, nothing left of it worth anything to anybody really building something. It had, been, had holes eaten into it. It had little. It, it was just corroded to pieces. Yet somebody had taken time to sandblast it, and that somebody was God, to sandblast that sheet of metal that was shiny clean. There was no rust left left on it. You knew it had been rusty. You knew it had been corroded. You knew it had been under the elements, but it had been already totally eradicated. All the rust had been eradicated. All the corrosion had been taken off. So it was just a worthless piece of sheet metal. And I asked God, what is going on? And he says, I'm cleaning up my church to make her usable, to paraphrase. I'm blasting the rust and corrosion off of my church. And I know he meant during this lockdown, during a shutdown was part of it. And uh, I've got it totally cleaned up, ready to use. And uh, at least it's going to be cleaned up, ready to use. I don't know what the time frame was. And uh, I said, but God, this piece of metal is worthless. Nobody doing any real body work would ever use that. It's just trash. He said, what man would call useless, I'm going to build my church on. And then I said, but, but listen, this is over a period of time. I said, that piece of metal, why isn't it like a piece of a fender or a quarter panel, a rocker panel, something off of a car, or something used, instead of just a plain sheet of metal? He said, I'm not building on anything man's built before. I'm starting and building it my own way. And so that piece of sheet metal he's blasted clean was actually a piece of raw material, never used for anything else. But now God was going to use it. And I really believe God's about to do a new thing in the church like we've never seen before. He's going to move in a fashion we've never expected. And he's going to build this end time church and fill it with his glory and bring in his harvest. And we're going to see the greatest days the church has ever known. Amen. There will be challenges. There will be persecutions. But God has this all in hand. Amen. And then about two weeks ago, uh, again at prayer, I'm trying to think it was the same night or not. No, this was at home. Uh, the Lord spoke to me the word bride and chamber. So I put him into my search engine, and I found the only verse in the Bible where bride and chamber show up as separate words. It wasn't bride chamber. It was bride and chamber. And it's in Joel chapter 2, verse 16, and it says the bridegroom, is come, the bridegroom is coming out of his chamber and the bride's coming out of her closet. And Joel chapter 2 is a chapter all about the army of God being raised up, a covenant body of believers. It's about the wicked being judged, like draining the swamp. And it's also about the restitution of all things. God's going to restore everything the worms, the palmer worm, the canker worm uh, have eaten. Amen. And it's also the, the chapter that Peter uh, spoke out of on the day of Pentecost. Oh, there's the day of Pentecost again. On the day of Pentecost, Peter said, your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Right? Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. That's straight out of Joel chapter 2. So Joel 2 is about a major outpouring of the Spirit that includes the bridegroom coming out of his chamber and the bride from her closet. And I believe the Lord said, I've got the bride in her closet right now. She's being prepared for the wedding. Amen. Understand there are wise bridesmaids and there are foolish bridesmaids. Amen. 
And there's some of the church that's wise enough to prepare to be part of the bride and part of the church is not preparing. And God's going to use, he's blasting, he's sandblasting those, the corruption off of those that will volunteer to be used uh, to make part of this bride. Again, I am convinced, 100% convinced, that the bride is not the entire church. Because scripture says the bride has made herself ready. The bride is cooperating with the Spirit of God to let God sandblast them, to, to, to knock off the rust and corrosion and corruption out of their life, to deliver them from doing things their way and teach them to how to function in the kingdom of heaven, right? And so, in fact, last May, May of 2019, I had a word from God come to me that the Lord said, those that want to carry the glory of God in the end times must become masters of functioning in the kingdom of heaven. You must learn how to activate the principles of the kingdom. And otherwise, you can't move out in that glory. You've got to learn how it operates. Pretty much like you're not going to fly an airplane without learning how to, to fly or ride a motorcycle without learning how to ride a motorcycle. You, you're going to get hurt if you, if you don't. And so uh, in the same way, we're not just going to step into, oh, I'm just flowing in the glory. It's going to be learning to apply the principles of the kingdom. I believe there'll be an outpouring, but the outpouring is going to come on the wheel of sons of God that have prepared themselves to carry that glory. Amen. They're learning how the kingdom functions. They're learning how to live by faith and speak the word. You know, again, I want to, I want to share this story again. Uh, do you remember the story of Elijah and Elisha? And Elisha was actually Elijah's gopher. It was his aide, his, his servant learning the anointing. And we don't know how long Elisha followed Elijah, but for some time. And when it came time for Elijah to be caught up to heaven, he said to Elisha, what do you want? Now, many believe, and I lean that direction as well, that Elijah was a type of Jesus and Elisha is a type of the church. Remember, Jesus was caught up to heaven. So was Elijah. And uh, Elisha said, I want a double portion of the anointing that's on your life. And so he said, if you see me caught up, you'll have it. And so, of course, he was, right? As just as much as the disciples saw Jesus caught up to heaven and received with his spirit. And so uh, Elisha receives the double portion. Right away, he takes that mantle and parts the Jordan River. And he starts doing miracles. And I think it's really the second Really the third recorded miracle, we have Elisha uh, that is not a good miracle. Some children come out making fun of him, hollering, go up, you bald head, go up, you bald head, ridiculing him. And it says he lost his temper and he cursed him in the name of the Lord. And when he did, two she-bears came out and killed 42 children, tore 42 children. Now, do you believe that was the will of God that 42 children got killed? just because they made fun of the prophet? No. That was a prophet with a double portion anointing on his life that lost control of his tongue and misused the power of God and caused great destruction versus great benefit. And God can't put his glory on an end-time church that doesn't learn how to control what they say. We've got to become masters of controlling the words that come out of our mouth if we're going to carry this glory. Amen. We can't have bitter water and sweet coming out of the same fountain, our tongue, and think it's going to work. We've got to learn how to control everything we say. Amen. And so uh, God's preparing the bride to carry this in time glory. Well, I started doing some word searches in the Bible on rust, corrosion, corruption, anything to do with destruction like that. and combined with some of my knowledge of restoring vehicles and other things, I'm, I've always been uh, enjoyed restoring things. doesn't have to be a car or a motorcycle. I, I like delivering anything from the trash dump. If I can fix it, I want to fix it just to keep it from being thrown away. And uh, so I've done, I've done quite a bit of body work, painting, some painting, painted a, quite a few cars, quite a few motorcycles, depending what quite a few is, but several. And uh, fixed a whole lot of stuff. In fact, we've not had a repairman, an appliance repairman in our house 
in over 25 years, probably closer to thir over 30 years, uh, because I fix them. I just have learned how to fix things. And if I can't fix it, I'll tear it up trying and then pitch it and get a new one. But I'm going to give it a shot. And so uh, I've learned how to deal with rust and corrosion and deterioration of things. Amen? And what's salv salvageable and what isn't. Fortunately, with God, we're all salvageable. Amen? And he wants to knock some things off of us. But I want to talk about a comparison between spiritual corruption and natural corruption. How to recognize natural corruption versus spiritual corruption. And what do you do about it? And I've got verses for much of this. So first of all, I want to talk about going back to this piece of sheet metal. What causes a piece of metal to rust? What causes it to corrode in the natural? Well, in the natural, if you work on cars, and you guys, guys ever work on cars? I know some of you out there watching my video have worked on vehicles. The number one source or cause of rust in vehicles is when dirt and mud, I guess mud is wet dirt, right? When really mostly dirt packed in uh, grime gets tucked into places in, in, in the car that can hold moisture. See, if you don't have the dirt, there's nothing to hold, hold the moisture. It will pretty much flow out. But many cars, you know, you drive them, and over time, there starts packing mud up under them, especially if you're driving dirt roads or out in the field or whatever. It'll pack this mud under it. And that mud goes against the body panels from underneath many times, and when that gets wet, it just holds the moisture. And it starts to eat away the steel panels. Amen. So the number one cause is going to be dirt. In our case, spiritual, that would be some type of sin, right? Some type of contamination in our lives causes corruption. Uh, in fact, that you can have a pretty car. In fact, I bought this Tahoe for the church here, for the Chariots of Light here last year, and it looked really nice on the outside. It had some rough spots until I got it home and found they've been driving it through fields. It was a field vehicle. And it was virtually packed underneath with six inches of mud packed underneath. And I probably spent an hour or two underneath the car with a pressure washer trying to get it cleaned out. I mean, baked on stuff. And it's, it was hidden. And much of the corrosion or corruption or rust that Trish's carry is hidden sin. May look fine on the outside, but underneath there's something eating away at their life. And it's disqualifying them from carrying the glory of God. It's not enough to say, praise the Lord, and look at me. You better be letting the Holy Ghost clean you from the inside out. You know, I had a boss years ago who gave me some advice. I think it was great advice. He said, every spring, once they're no longer salting the roads, go to the car wash and get the bottom of your car bottom blasted. If you can't go to the car wash, do it yourself. Then I'll, they now make pressure washer attachments just to spray under your car, to spray up. And he says, what you want to do is get all of that salt off the bottom of your car before spring. You follow me? Because that salt eats at your vehicle. And of course, you know, for us, salt represents covenant. And some people can't stand the covenant. We'll talk about that again in a minute. But... Uh, that hidden sin eating away at people's lives. And I believe as the bride's in her closet right now, God's dealing with hidden issues. Things maybe, maybe nobody knows but your spouse. Maybe they don't know. People close to you may have an inkling, but you've been hiding it pretty well. And God's saying, we've got to deal with this right now. I can't put my glory on you with that in your life. It will not just destroy you. It will do damage to others around you. Amen. That's why God's dealing with things like pride right now, with self-serving motivations, with any addiction to money or dependence upon anything of the world. He's dealing with that right now. You know, it's amazing to me in this shutdown how in virtually one day, really about a week, God brought down the majority of the major idols in America. In one week, the NCAA was shut down. 
The NBA was shut down. Major League Baseball was shut down. The Hockey League was shut down. And now it's even tampering with football in the fall, potentially. <gasps> Not football in the fall. Uh, right now, the teams, the, the colleges cannot do spring practices. The, it's just, it shut things down. Idols of man are falling. And guess what? We survived it. We survived so far without the NBA, NCAA, and, and Major League Baseball. And, of course, whoever missed hockey anyway. Sorry for all those northern people watching right now. Amen. So trap dirt is a major is the major cause of corruption or corrosion in a vehicle of rust. The, the number one cause is oxygen getting to bare metal. And the water allows it to hold, that dirt allows it to hold water that lets oxygen eat away at the steel. Amen. Uh, another thing that allows rust to hit a car is damaged paint. It's amazing how you can get a little chip in your paint job. And before you know it, it may take a couple years, now there's a rust bubble there. Because bare steel rusts very rapidly. What happens, you may have a little chip. That's why it's so important if you start getting chips in the front of your hood to get some touch-up paint and touch those in. Because what will happen is rust will start getting underneath that and eating at the steel underneath the paint. You don't even know what's going on. And all of a sudden, you get a rust bubble. You guys know what a rust bubble is? It's where, hey, the paint, what's wrong with my paint? It's kind of bowed out. It's kind of, it looks inflamed. There's rust under there. You know, a lot, a lot of times it'll come from underneath all the way through and you get the rust bubbles. Other times it's because there was a, a area of the damaged paint that it came through. And so the damaged paint, for us, you know, that's it's amazing how many people go by what color a car is. Like my wife. It doesn't matter what the car is. It can be the snazziest car ever. And she goes, I like that color paint. If somebody drove by in an orange Maserati, she goes, I don't like that car. It's a Maserati. We don't care what color it is. Amen, but it's not the right look for her. And a lot of people have a poor self-image. And it lets this corruption come into their lives. Let's, let's rust start to build in their lives because they're not speaking the right things over their lives. These all cause corruption or corrosion in us. And then another one is uh, fire damage. Uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar with, the, with, with how fire can destroy steel. When they make steel, what they have to do is heat it to a certain temperature, depending on what they want to do with the steel, and then they cool it at the right rate, either in oil or water or uh, air or whatever, and they cool it to get the steel to form the right crystalline structures. And it's called tempering. And tempering determines how flexible steel is or how hard it is, what its, what its tendencies are. But once you take tempered steel and it's, ex it's exposed to a fire, it virtually destroys that steel. It doesn't have to melt it. It takes the temper out of the steel. And what happens all of a sudden is now that steel starts to corrode. It starts to rust. You know, I remember on our farm in Tennessee, we had a forest fire come through, and it burnt all along our fence rows. And the posts were fine. The wire looked fine, but it took the temper out of the wire. And within a year, all the, all the nice galvanized barbed wire is now rusty. It's, it allowed corrosion in. So when things go through inappropriate fire, it takes the temper out. When they go through fire unshielded or unguarded, it takes the temper out. Now go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. You should already be there, right? Are you there? Charles, how long have I been going? 20? It says in verse 24. Now it's talking about the body of Christ. Go to verse 18 first. But now hath God set the members, every one of them, in the body as it has pleased him. God is assembling his church, his, his body of Christ in these end times, putting every block in place where he wants it. But look at verse 24. For our comely or good-looking parts have no need, 
God's not concerned about looks. He's concerned about function. Remember our form versus function discussion? The religious church is concerned about form, but God's concerned about function. So he says, hey, that which looks good, that's not what I'm after. We're not after appearance. He says, but God has tempered, say tempered, has tempered the body together, having given the more abundant honor to that part which lacked. In other words, that part which seemed limited or lacking. Verse 25, that there should be no schism or division in the body, but that every member should have the same care one for another. Now it says God's tempered the body together. Let me explain tempering again for just a minute. When you make tempered steel, it's not pure iron. They take steel and mix it with carbon. Really just soot. They mix carbon with iron atoms at the right percentage, heated to the right temperature, and those carbon atoms intermix with this iron atoms and form steel. Steel is only part iron. It's like 98% iron, much of it, but it's got carbon in there and many times other things as well. And so what they do is they mix those together, and that's called the tempering, putting together the pieces that are dissimilar, but you're fusing it together as one element. And uh, God says he's tempering the body together. He's taking each of us from different backgrounds, different experiences, different cultural uh, areas, different financial levels, and he's putting us together as the body of Christ. Different motivational gifts. You follow me? And he's making us one body. All different. All different, but one body. You know, I had somebody come to me a few days ago and say, I'm not like everybody else. What's my position in the body? And I, I explained to them a few things that God's having them doing and what he could have them doing in the future. But we don't know. Just know you're part of the body, and God's doing, doing the work. Amen. He's tempered the body together. But when somebody goes through the fire inappropriately, they lose their temper. Not talking about they go into a rage. They lose their ability to stand in covenant with one. Next thing you know, they're leaving the church. They're talking about, about the pastor or the pastor's wife. You get in trouble like that. Now watch it now. They're, they're running off to sin. They don't care about what they're called to. They're only concerned about what they want to do. And they let in jealousy, envy, backbiting, gossip, strife, and produce division. They've lost their temper because of inappropriate experience with fire. I mean, no, we're going to go through some fires. Amen. But you've got to maintain a covenant mentality. You've got to keep in mind you're called to the church God's assigned you to, and you're going to go through some challenges. Don't lose your temper. Amen. Don't lose your ability to stay fused together. So these are, these are things that cause... Uh, cause corruption or corrosion or rust in the natural things and even in the church. But I want to take it further regarding spiritual, cause of spiritual corruption. Go to Galatians chapter 6. Are you still with me? Robert trying to get on camera there. He had a day dawn all of a sudden. <laughs> Praise God. Galatians chapter 6, have you got it? Verse 8. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, rust and corrosion, deterioration, right? Deterioration. But he that soweth to the spirit shall of the spirit reap life everlasting. The opposite of corruption. That's actually restoration. But it says when you sow to the flesh, you let corruption in. Now again, it can be outward sin, it can be hidden sin. But it stores up that moisture, that inappropriate moisture, and causes you to start breaking down from the inside out. What's the saying? Sin always costs you more than you thought it was going to cost. 
stays longer than you thought it was going to stay. I got it backwards, didn't I? Costs you more than you thought you, had to, you were going to have to pay. Sin will mess you up. And some people start becoming rusted or corroded because they start tampering with sin. And God will call you on it. If you're trying to walk in a relationship with him, he will show you those areas. The Spirit of God is in the business of showing you the corruption in your life. And as I've said many times, it's been my personal experience, probably 80% or more of what God shows me is something I need to adjust. Am I the only one? He'll show me things in the world and prophecies and give me visions. He'll show me things in the body and, you know, of course, he's giving me a revelation of the word. But I'm, I'm talking about the things God's showing me that needs adjusting are almost always with me. Amen. As much as in my mind, my wife may need adjusting at times. God said, that's my job, not yours. I'm not showing you that stuff. Keep it to yourself. Amen. And I've watched God do it. Now she's perfect. So you wonder how I was going to recover from that, didn't you? Amen. Sin brings forth corruption. That's why this hyper grace doctrine is so, is so dangerous. Is because they're told that God can't see your sin. He won't convict you of it. So when they hear any conviction of sin, they attribute it to just condemnation. And they, they entertain the sin without think, knowing, without realizing the corrosion it's going to cause. I want God to show me anything in my life. I plead with God to show me anything in my life. Don't let me get away with it. I can't afford. I can't afford to tamper with the anointing being in any way infiltrated or, or, or neutralized to entertaining things of the world. Got to tell you what to watch on television and what not to watch, right? Amen. Uh, Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, this is Jesus speaking in verse 19. He says, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where there neither rust, moth, nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through and steal. For where your treasures, there, is your heart, there will your heart be also. Now, one thing that can cause rust in your life is hoarding treasures. Now, I don't believe it's the possession of things that causes problems. It's the dependency upon those things. I believe the corruption comes into two areas. One, you value this more than you value your time with God or anything that God has to offer you. You'd rather have a new car than a gift of the Spirit. Amen? You'd rather have a, a new TV than experience a move of the, move of the Holy Ghost. And the other is you're dependent upon it. As I said many times, so many people come to me, they're, they're new to say, to say, I'm believing God for a million dollars. God, God's not going to bring you a million dollars. It would destroy you spiritually. You'd put all your trust in that million dollars versus God. And so many people are hoarding up treasures because it becomes their nest egg they're dependent upon more than God. And God's not bringing the glory to those that depend on anybody or anything but him. Amen. And again, God wants you to have an abundance. He wants you to become a, a sewing machine. He wants you to become a distribution center. He wants you to become somebody he can pour out great wealth through. Amen? And he'll let you keep a bunch of it too, if that's what you want, but not if it has you. I don't want anything in my life that can't speak to me and tell me to sow it, and as far as I'm going, as far as I'm concerned, it's gone. And everything I own, other than my wife, is up for sowing possibilities. Well, I can't sell the house because the bank owns too much of it. But uh, We've got to make sure our treasure's not on things on earth, but things of the Spirit. Another thing, I remember when I was first saved, this would have been in 1984. 
I set myself to read the Bible. And of course, I'd never read it. I'd read a few verses, but I never read it. And I said, I'm going to read the Bible. And I started in Genesis, started reading through. And I read through Genesis and Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy and Joshua and Judges and Ruth. And, you know, I'm going through. And uh, I don't know if I understood a thing I read. Never been raised in church, knew nothing. I understood the stories, but from the spiritual significance. Wasn't hearing God speak to me in anything major other than what my wife needed to change. And uh, I remember coming to Isaiah. I don't remember the chapter, but God spoke to me. He says, thou shalt not worship the work of thine hands. And I had, a, I had an encounter with the Spirit of God on that. Don't take your pride in what you do. Take pride in what God does through you. You follow me? Don't, don't try to impress people with what you're doing in the natural. Be more concerned about letting God see your hidden works. And uh, it spoke to me. I'm talking about this is now 36 years ago. Well, 35 and a half. And uh, boom, God spoke. What was he doing? He was, he was dealing with stuff inside of me. He needed out of the way to keep rust from forming. And he wants to deliver us from anything of the world system that what our heart would connect to. You know, I share some of these stories many times, so y'all bear with me. But I hadn't been saved very long as well. And I was praying one day, and I said, God, I want to hear your voice. Because I hear always people talking about hearing the voice of God. I wouldn't hear any voice of God. I mean, I'd know things, but I wouldn't hear a voice. I wouldn't hear that voice like they talked about. I was jealous of their voice. So I'm praying, and God, let me hear your voice. This went on for a long time. And all of a sudden, he spoke to me. I mean, it was clear. I want you to give up watching Tennessee football. I said, God, I really want to hear your voice. I, I knew it was a voice, but I wouldn't hear, want to hear that. See, don't ask to hear voices you don't want to follow. And this went on for about two weeks, if I remember the, the time frame right. I want to hear your voice. And God said, finally, he said, if you want to hear anything other than give up Tennessee football, you better give up Tennessee football. And I went 10 years without watching any football. And I had to white knuckle it at first. It had such a hold on my life. Now I can watch it. It doesn't matter. But back then, it was life or death. It determined my, my mood for the week, whether they won or lost. And God said, I got to break that. I got to get that idolatry out of your life. Because I let my image and, and, and my own, how can I say, personal stature be tied to how a football team did. That I never played for. Amen? And so these are things God will deal with you on to free you from the treasures of the earth. Go to James chapter 5. James chapter 5, verse 1. Go to now, you rich man, weep and howl for your miseries. This shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted, and your garments are moth-eaten. Remember Jesus talked about the rust and the moths eating your treasures? He said, yours are full of moths and rust. Talking to rich men. Not all rich men, but this group of them. He said, your gold and silver is cankered, and the rust of them shall be a witness against you. Now, this is interesting. Gold and silver don't rust. But yet, God said, they're going to rust. You know, gold doesn't even corrode. You can drop a bar of gold in the ocean for 2,000 years and dig it up. It'll still look like a shiny bar of gold. Sure, once you knock the monocles off of it. It's a precious metal. It's amazing to me as well that in the very beginning of Genesis, God told Adam, the gold is down that river, and it's good. God announced at the beginning of creation what would be of value even today, the gold. And it's still the standard of wealth for a, a nation or an individual, right? God knew that from the beginning. So he said, the rest of them shall be a witness against you. 
and you shall eat your flesh as it were fire. There's our fire. You have heaped treasure together for the last days. Now, apparently, God hates the wicked hoarding the finances. Amen. And not letting it flow. And, of course, he hates them for using it for the wrong purposes as well. And he says, you heaped it together for the end times, for the last days. Scripture tells us clearly, through Proverbs 13, 22, the wealth of the wicked is laid up for the righteous. I'm telling you, as the bride comes out of her closet, in the near future, there will be an inversion of the wealth of the wicked to the hands of the righteous. Amen. And all those schemes to use their money for wickedness are going to be brought back on their own heads because they're going to lose the money. And it's going to be used to, to birth revival in these end times. So what I'm getting at is we're talking about what causes corrupt or corrosion. Follow me on this. What you do with your money, what God you honor with your money, how you treat other people with regard to money will determine whether you rust or not, whether you bring it inviting corrosion or not. Because if you're more concerned about making money than you are treating people right, you put yourself in a dangerous place. If money's your God and not Jesus is your Lord, you're in a dangerous place. And if you refuse to sow and to tithe, if you refuse to tithe, you're in a very dangerous place because it's clear here God's bringing a declaration of judgment upon a people that did not honor him financially amen not tithing and not sowing cause corruption in your life and it'll start eating you from the inside out unless you take steps to rectify the situation look at verse 4 Behold, the hire of the laborers who have stripped down your, or reaped down your fields, which is of you kept back by fraud, fraudulent activity, crieth. And the cries of them which have reaped have entered into the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth or the Lord of armies. Remember when we talked about the Lord of armies, the Lord of hosts, it always represents the end times. And God said, your willingness to hold back what's rightfully owed other people, where you schemed and you connived and you stolen, you conned, you taken advantage of people's hardships. It's coming back upon your own head. In these end times, I'm going to take what's yours, what you think is yours, and give it to those you've stolen from. He says, you've lived in pleasure. Verse 5, on the earth and have been wanton. You have nourished your horses in the day of slaughter. You condemned and killed the just, and he does not resist you. Be patient, therefore, brethren, for the coming Lord. Behold, the husband waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth. God is putting together the bride's coming for his bridegroom, the end time inversion of wealth, the judgment of the wicked, the stripping of them of their power all coming together in this one book of James. And we're in that season. I really believe when God showed me that sheet of corroded metal, he was pointing to these type of verses, these type of passages. What an exciting time to be following God. Matthew chapter 7. Feel like Woody up here. Are you following me? What's he say? Can I get a witness? Come on now. Matthew chapter 7. Jesus says, verse 16. You shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? In other words, you're not going to the thorn bush to, to get grapes. You're going to the thorn vine, I mean to the grapevine, right? 
Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. Every tree that bringeth forth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire, wherefore by their fruits you shall know them. We're talking about how to identify corruption in an individual, spiritual corruption, even if they look make good look good on the outside. Look at their fruit. What are they producing with their life? Are they building their own empire? Or are they working for the kingdom of heaven? Are they living where they're trying to protect their own assets and just build a nice security blanket or nest egg for themselves? Or are they, are they really involved in activating spiritual principles? See God move in their lives. And of course, we take it further. Are they living in wickedness? Or are they living in righteousness? By their fruits, you shall know them. I don't remember the exact, <clears throat> how can I say, wait, this was told to me, but Pastor Callan has shared this with us many times. I don't remember where he got it from. But a lot of vacation resorts like Las Vegas or, you know, I'm trying to think of one down in Mexico. Uh, what's that? Cancun like that. We have pastors come in. And the pastors will involve themselves in all type of sin while they're there. But when they come back, they have to look squeaky clean. But when they get down there, they're living a corrupt life. As if God doesn't see that. These things ought not be. What that is, is that is rust underneath a good looking paint job. And I'm telling you, God's cleaning it up in these end times. And those men of God are going to lose their positions if they don't turn things around. Amen. Well, God understands I'm only human. I understand he gave you the word to overcome sin. Amen. I also recognize if you're born again, you're no longer a human. You're a child of God. You're of a new spiritual DNA. Amen. New rights, new inheritance. So, an evil heart. Hey, somebody's given over to corruption, really still sowing to the flesh, allows this rust to come in. And go to Proverbs chapter 25. Because I really believe this verse ties into where we are right now. Proverbs 25. And go to verse number 26. A righteous man falling down before the wicked is as a troubled fountain and a corrupt spring. A corrupt spring. This is interesting because Proverbs represents the wisdom of God. And he said when the righteous are bowing down to the wicked, we kind of have that in Kentucky right now with our governor having to kowtow to all his ridiculous rules he might have brought, want to bring forth. You follow me? Want to authorize killing babies, but tell the churches they can't open. And it says, when the righteous bow down to the wicked, it's as a corrupt spring. See, if God's going to have his purified body, he's got to deal with this verse too. There's got to be an inversion of the authority who's in authority in the nation. And I really believe God's birthing through the president, through those he's surrounding himself with right now, an effort to drain the swamp in Washington for the righteous to step back into positions of power. Amen? In the courts, especially the Supreme Court, in the Senate, the House, all the positions of influence, the Board of Education, all of it. God wants to have people of righteous, how can I say, righteousness and holiness in those positions. Otherwise, there's corruption. And it's amazing. Here we are, a church that's been proclaimed to be a Christian nation full of so much corruption. 
Washington is a septic pit of filth and evil. Amen. A church, a God-birthed Christian-filled nation being dominated by a bunch of wickedness in the capital. We cannot bring the glory to America with that in that place. God's going to make some changes. Amen? Well, listen, we've just discussed, we've covered tonight what causes corruption in this metal. In the following weeks, we're going to discuss how to recognize it better. And then we're going to talk about, get my notes out here, put these in order, why we've got to remove it. You know, in a car, they call rust a cancer. It's a cancer to the steel. And if you don't cut it out, it'll keep eating away at the good metal until it destroys the car. You know, uh, it's Hank's last name, Bird. Hank Bird up in Illinois goes to Pastor Bob's church, runs a, runs a record service. He restores old cars, cars. He has a car like I used to have. He has a 63 Ford Oh, now what's the model? Galaxy. Galaxy 500. I had a 63 Ford Galaxy 500 back when I was a teenager. And uh, love that car. No mufflers on it. Sounded great. He got this car to restore, and when he took the body off of the frame, the frame was so eat up, so eat up by rust, it was unusable. He has to have a new frame to put it on. So the whole job is on hold indefinitely till he finds some way to replace that frame. Rust is like a cancer to metal. And if we don't take it out, it won't support anything. It'll fall apart where you're trying to run. And God's going to deal with the corruption in the church as well. And then we're going to discuss how do you take it out? How do we get this corruption out of our lives? And uh, both naturally and spiritually, we're going to find there's parallels to both. Amen. Well, keep your temper. Amen. Stay in covenant.